Good evening, everyone. I'm Ellen Rathje. I really appreciate you all spending this uh, afternoon and evening with us to, to hear about the New Zealand earthquakes. Uh, Brendan did a great job introducing the two events, and what I'll be doing in the next 15 to 20 minutes is to talk a little bit about the reconnaissance that was performed after these two events, and really how we've started to bring new technologies into play where maybe t 10 years ago they were very um, uncommon to use these type of technologies, but really they are becoming the norm for our reconnaissance going forward. I always forget the acknowledgments, so I'm putting them up first. Um, and so this, the stuff I'm going to present today represents the accumulation of a, effort from a lot of people. We had a large team down in Kaikoura after the event, uh, people from GNS, which is the New Zealand's equivalent of the USGS, many people on our gear team, the USGS as well. Uh, so I want to acknowledge all of them. And I'll show you some stuff that we've been doing in satellite remote sensing, and, and I just want to acknowledge the students as well as the colleagues in New Zealand uh, and the U.S. who have been working on that with me. So I think when I, when I look at uh, the GEAR experience over the last 15 years when we've been in existence, there's really in the last, say, five to six years what I like to call a, a renaissance and reconnaissance. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and we're moving really from qualitative observations, where we go out and we take pictures and make important observations, uh, but they're still qualitative. And now we're starting to really make quantitative measurements of what has occurred. And when we look at the ability to make those quantitative measurements, we're taking advantage of various technologies. And the ones I'll talk about today are satellite imagery. Uh, probably you've all at least played around on Google Earth or Google Maps, so you all know what, what we can see from, from, the, from the sky. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about how we're using them, again, not just to uh, look at damage, but to, to measure and document. Uh, and then, of course, there's LIDAR, and uh, we're also more frequently using uh, UAVs. So when you look at these three different technologies, they really have, they play different roles in the reconnaissance. Uh, if you look first at satellite imagery, you really can get the big picture. You can look at regional scale assessments. So I just show you here the shake maps for the two events that uh, Brendan introduced so well, uh, the Christchurch and Kaikoura events. You know, if you look at the areas affected, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of square miles. And to try and get a rapid assessment of what has occurred is quite difficult. Uh, yet, the satellite imagery can play a role in documenting these earthquake effects at a regional scale. And in particular, when you look at geotechnical effects, such as liquefaction or landslides, they're particularly particularly well suited uh, for using satellite imagery to, to uh, identify uh, those effects. So I'll talk a little bit about satellite imagery with respect to both liquefaction and landslides. But also our reconnaissance teams now are almost always bringing in people who do LIDAR. And the LIDAR allows us to look, when we're looking at a site scale, so a single site, um, being able to develop detailed 3D models, and probably many of you are starting to use LIDAR perhaps in your own work uh, here in New York. But uh, in case you're not familiar, you know, LIDAR takes advantage of lasers, uh, and you, sh you shoot layers or the laser at the ground, measure the travel time to get the distance, and knowing the location of where you sent that laser, you can then develop a, a 3D digital elevation model. We can put the LiDAR on a plane, we can put it on a tripod, uh, but in the end we can get a really nice uh, 3D point cloud. Here's an example from the Chile earthquake in 2010 of an embankment failure, and you can see very clearly uh, the failure on the edge, and now we're not just taking pictures of this, we can actually start making some real measurements. Another um, technology that's really just starting, I think, to make its way into our reconnaissance is the ability to develop 3D models using simply a large collection of photographs. Uh, and this, you, you know, back in the day was called digital photogrammetry, uh, now um, often called structure from motion. The key here is if you take photographs of the same area from different points of location, uh, we can put them in a computer algorithm. The computer can identify common points in all the images, back calculate where you took each image from, and with all that information can actually develop 3D point clouds. So real, it, much cheaper than trying to have a laser, putting on an aircraft, et cetera. Um, so you can take these pictures uh, standing on the ground, uh, or more commonly, now we're using UAVs. So we can put these cameras on UAVs, um, 
take these pictures, be able to take the pictures from over a much broader area than you could on the ground, and then you can develop a 3D model. And here's just an example uh, from a paper I took in geomorphology where from about 3,000 photographs, which is quite a lot, um, you can see this rock outcrop, which is a, you know, about 40 meters or so wide. Um, you can see the detail that can, is put together in the 3D model. So I'm going to talk a little bit again about how we're using these different technologies for the different um, earthquakes, uh, the Christchurch and the Kaikoura events. So Brendan already showed you the wide scale, widespread liquefaction that occurred during the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, and that's indicated here, again, by the, the warm red colors, where is the most severe liquefaction. And a lot of this initial mapping at this broader scale was actually done by looking at air photos and satellite imagery. And you can simply look, here's just an example of of uh, one area along the Avon River pre-earthquake. We can see all the homes, we can see the roads, we can see the bridge uh, looking pretty, uh, you know, undam looking undamaged before the event. And then after the earthquake, we can see lots of ejecta. You can see some cracks, you can see some damage on the, uh, on the bridge as well. So here you can see relatively quickly, uh, we can identify damage and start identifying where people need to go in terms of doing their reconnaissance. And this makes us much more prepared when we go into the field. We're not going out into the field asking people, what did you see? Where should we go? We know already where we want to go when we are looking at reconnaissance. But more recently, we've taken satellite imagery, I think, to the next level and what we can do with it. And we start, we've been able to measure displacements, horizontal displacements, using the pre- and post-event satellite imagery. So here, if we have a satellite image of uh, the Christchurch area as shown here, one before and one after the earthquake, if we align them very well with each other, then we can identify where segments of each Im the, the image have moved in between the two acquisitions. And we did this analysis for the Christchurch event and here, looking in that small study area, the, uh, these are the displacement av amplitudes along the Avon River. So you can see, for instance, in this northern, this uh, north-south stretch, we've got amplitudes that are, tend to be in the 2 to 2.5 meter range right along the river. We can see them grading back to, say, less than a half a meter further away. Of course, uh, so, so you would see that this is indicating movement towards the river lateral spreading due to the liquefaction. Of course, when we first got this result, we said we have to look at some field, hard field data. Do we trust these displacements? And so the first thing we did is we looked at where people had mapped cracks. And you see that the cracks map generally uh, along the largest displacements that we've observed. Now, of course, cracks mean you're only measuring displacements that manifest themselves on cracks, no ductile displacement. Uh, satellite imagery shows you a little bit more detail of that du ductile displacement, but they're very consistent with one another. And now you can get a displacement map of essentially the entire city. And we've also looked at some very detailed comparisons from um, transects, for instance, where uh, people have measured displacement cracks as a function of distance from the river. And so uh, you can see that the uh, displacement trends and the profiles from the imagery and the ground surveys uh, match quite well. And so it's very encouraging to see how this type of data can now be used to better understand liquefaction and in particular lateral spreading and the movements caused by liquefaction. And when you start having large scale maps where you have displacements across an entire region, it really opens up what we can start looking at. So here on the left, you see uh, displacements that we've measured. The hot spots are again, the largest displacements. And on the, on, the, on the right, you see a digital elevation model which came from LIDAR. And you can start seeing, well, how topography perhaps influenced these displacements by looking at you know, how far inland things extended, how does that compare to the topography, uh, the geology, uh, et cetera. So it really opens up a lot of research avenues for helping us understand liquefaction and lateral spreading. So let me move on to the Kaikoura earthquake. Um, which happened, as you heard, just a few months ago. Um, landslides we knew from the outset, from the initial reports, were the major concern. But 
there was un, it was unknown really how extensive the landsliding was, or let's say how far it extended inland, how far it extended up and down the coast. They very quickly got into the air uh, in, in helicopters and were taking lots of pictures, um, but still it was not. It was still a snapshot. They knew it was it was quite diff, uh, quite bad, a lot of landslides, but the the extent was still a little unknown. We came in and started to look at what we could see from the satellite imagery. First of all, landslides are perfectly suited for identifying in on uh, satellite imagery because typically you strip the vegetation. And so the, what was green before is now brown and that's typically a landslide. In this event, Landsat, which is you know a, a, a satellite that is run by NASA, actually captured imagery the day after the earthquake. We had that imagery within, uh, within another day or so. But the problem always with optical imagery is cloud cover. So although the Landsat image was probably, the scene was probably this big, the blue area is the only area that was cloud free. So it was the only area we could identify landslides. Um, the other difficulty with Landsat is resolution. The fact is 15, each pixel is 15 meters by 15 meters. And so you can't see smaller landslides and the detail is somewhat um, limited. But within just a few days, high resolution imagery came in. Uh, came in. Uh, they, USGS has agreements with the commercial companies that collect these data and, and they made it available to our gear team. And so with, and, and the pink area here represents all the different uh, scenes that we analyze with high, at, at that high resolution. And we were able to, to develop our first landslide inventory within about five days after the event and shared that with the GNS and the folks in country there. And it really helped guide us in our gear reconnaissance as we went out into the field. So let's take a look at Clarence. Um, so this Clarence is, uh, the Clarence River comes into the ocean here a little bit further to the north. The epicenter of the earthquake is down here and then Wellington would be off the north uh, edge of the island there. So in terms of identifying landslides, which we did manually, which may sound quite difficult, we tried to do some semi-automated techniques, but in the end, it was quicker to just have my graduate student um, <laughs> click and find all those landslides, and he did a, a, ma a marvelous job. And so each of these red areas represent landslides, uh, polygons that, that were indicated by the, the stripped vegetation. You can look at the geology right next door and start to see some uh, interesting trends. So first of all, you see a higher density of landslides in this area, which is this, the gray area here is represented by a gray wacky sandstone, which is pretty pervasive on the North Island. Um, so you can see there are localized areas of landslides in the gray wacky. There's some really interesting things going on down here, larger landslides, and you can see that's an area where there's some complex geology going on. We've got mudstone to the east, a little bit of limestone, and then we're on to the gray wacky again. And so that ended up being quite an interesting area where we started to look at. But let me show you a little bit about the different character of the different types of landslides. Um, if we look in the gray wacky, uh, a lot of areas, they were relatively shallow volume. So you can see similar to what um, Brendan showed along the coastal road. Uh, this may be a shallow landslide, but it's certainly enough to make that road to be unusable for up to a year. Uh, further inland in the gray wacky, you'd see similar um, shallow landslides. But there were, o there were not only shallow landslides in the gray wacky. Some of the largest landslides uh, happened in the gray wacky, and these were deeper seated landslides that caused very critical landslide dams that they were very concerned about. So you can see all this material coming down, blocking the river, and a very substantial landslide dam uh, created. There were dozens of landslide dams created. There was concern if they were breached, what would happen downstream. And so GNS's major concern when we were there was to document and characterize these, both how big they are, and then trying to model what would happen if they breached and how far would the water reach downstream and what communities would be impacted. And they used uh, LIDAR to, to help in that effort. For me, some of the most interesting landslide I have ever seen uh, are shown right here. Some of these deep-seated landslides that happened 
at the interface between the mudstone and the limestone. So you can see here on the Lita River, which is in the south near Waiu, this entire area used to be up there. So this, this is about a scale of a kilometer long. This landslide, when I first saw that picture before I went, I thought this was the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, I couldn't believe, I couldn't understand what this looked like before. It was, all this material was all there. So these are, again, landslides that are on the kilometer scale. As Brendan showed, the fault rupture was quite complex. That was our word of the week, complex, on the things that we saw. I like to say that this looks like just a glass shattered. The, the fault rupture went one way, turned left, then turned right. It, it, it really is fascinating. But if you look at those two areas that I just showed you, um, Clarence up along the coast and then the Leader River further down the south, they both occurred in areas where the fault rupture went through the landslide. So this idea of how the fault rupture interacted with the landslides is something that we'll be studying uh, for quite some time. So let me just quickly go through the Clarence area because it's really interesting to see what, what was happening here. So again, here's the coastline. These are the several landslides that have occurred uh, in relatively close proximity to one another. Um, that was called Limestone Hill. Uh, that's because there's a, on the back side is where the limestone is. There's a limestone quarry in the back. Uh, but this side is mudstone. Uh, this was, we called the cowslip line, uh, landslide. If you saw the news, the cows that were stuck uh, on, on uh, the little grassy promenade, that's where that happened. Although the farmer begged us not to call it cowslip anymore because he was getting hounded on, the, on social media for, by uh, animal rights groups for not taking good cares of his cows. But in the end, it's really the best name because everyone knows about the cows. So that's the cowslip landslide. Um, again, we've got this limestone. You can really clearly see this limestone here, but note this brown and gray. That's the mudstone. So we're seeing here's the interaction. The fault is right there. If we go further to the south, we see some shallow slides. And in fact, if we start looking at the geology, some of it starts to look very interesting. Again, the mudstone to the east, limestone hill, cowslip, right along the interface. This is the fault. And then the surficial slides were completely and solely in the limestone. So a completely different style of landsliding. That's the Papatia Fault. Parts of the Papatia Fault had 10 meters of displacement. Yet this fault was mapped as inactive because there was no evidence that it was active, at least in the quaternary. So that was very critical. So if we look, I got these from one of our colleagues that looked at the fault rupture. So here's the fault rupture going right through the landslide. And as we go, so this is on the north side of Cowslip. And then there's a little tree there. If we look through that tree, so we see the fault rupture continuing on. Here's Limestone Hill. Another small landslide in the middle, which in any other earthquake would have been a big landslide, but not in this one. And then we can see it continuing right across the river. So very interesting in terms of what was the, what was the impact of the fault rupture being through the landslide on this movement? Would the ground shaking have caused it solely? Was it simply the fact that we had limestone on top of mudstone, that interface at the, at the fault? How did those all play together? And that's something, again, we'll be studying, I think, for a while. But as, we, as I mentioned, we brought in a lot of technology for this event. We brought in drones. Um, to be able to develop 3D models of some of these uh, landslides. We had LIDAR. This is uh, GNS's uh, LIDAR. We also, from Oregon State, brought in some LIDAR. So the LIDAR was used on the landslide dams. It was used on some of these landslides. Also, some of these landslides were so big, using the terrestrial LIDAR has really been difficult, and they're planning on flying LIDAR over these areas in the near future. But just to give you an idea of what you can get out of this, so this is if you simply go into Google Earth and try and zoom in, uh, this is what the cowslip landslide looked like before. I think it's a great place for your cows to graze. Um, but that's what it looked like after. And this is a 3D model that was developed by um, John Manaukis, who uh, was our drone pilot and, and our geomatics expert. And so this is a 3D model that we then have rendered in Google Earth. But now you can start developing 2D cross-section, 3D cross-sections to start better understanding the geometry.
Finally, uh, just to bring things back to infrastructure, I do want to talk about how we use these technologies to look at the infrastructure response. And here's just an example of a, of a, a train culvert, uh, which the road, uh, the coastal road, uh, went over. We drove it every day. Um, we noticed there was, you know, some some movement and ground movement at the at the surface. So when we went down and looked at the walk through the culvert, looked a little um, distorted. And then, so uh, instead of spending the day taking measurements, which in the past what we would have done, uh, a couple days later, Mike Olson came in with his LIDAR and scanned not only the culvert itself, but also the surface. Uh, and so, and as you notice, this is kind of a slope down over the culvert up to the road. And then you can start getting now a 3D model of the, and, of the culvert and start really characterizing the change in shape, uh, the movements at the surface, and seeing how this really moderate amount of movement due to the slope could cause quite a bit of ovaling to the culvert. Um, so in summary, you've seen what we can do today now with satellite imagery in terms of rapidly evaluating regional damage. We can now even measure horizontal displacements, and I think that's really going to revolutionize our understanding of liquefaction effects. And then we're really starting to bring in these 3D terrain models, whether we develop them through LIDAR or structure from motion so that we can uh, better understand the geometries and use those as inputs, say, to numerical analyses we may do of these uh, failures. And I would be remiss if I didn't m mention the fact that all of this data that is being collected is now going to be shared. We ha really haven't had a mechanism to publish data uh, from these reconnaissance efforts. And so the data that you're seeing here um, from the LIDAR, from the satellite imagery, we are in the process of archiving them and publishing them uh, for future research via DesignSafe, which I didn't pay Sissy to mention it, but she did. And so I would be remiss if I didn't mention it as well. And so again, this is a cyber infrastructure uh, funded by the NSF for natural hazards engineering. And uh, there's data, published data that you may use. There are tools that you can do data analysis on those, uh, on those, on that data, and as well as a reconnaissance, reconnaissance portal that we're in the midst of developing. And so, uh, check it out, and uh, and you will soon find the data from the reconnaissance there. Thank you. <laughs>